got Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah to kind of help you uh, understand where to look in order to find this book. We've been looking through a lot of the minor prophets. We've, we've actually finished up, uh, tonight we will finish up the last of the minor prophets, which are only called minor because they're, they're shorter books, really. They're not really uh, minor because they're less significant, uh, but much more so because of the length of the books, which Lamentations is only five chapters, and it's considered a major prophet. So it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense, uh, you know, the way this is, is ordered or called. But we've, wor- we've worked our way through all of these minor prophets now, and you've probably been getting the impression that the message in the prophets are very similar, uh, that God is going to be just, that he's going to judge all of those who sin and rebel against him, uh, and that includes his people. We spent a lot of time looking all the prophecies against the nation of Israel and the northern kingdom of Israel, and then we looked at the prophecies against the southern kingdom of Judah uh, and, and saw the destruction of Jerusalem and how detailed that was with Jeremiah. And then we started a, a couple weeks back looking at prophecies that were given to other nations, where God sent a prophet to another nation, or his, his prophecy through that prophet was intended for uh, the, a nation to hear. Uh, and we looked at Jonah, who went to Nineveh and preached to the, the capital of the Syrians, and he didn't want to go, but he went, and God was showing grace to Nineveh and trying to help Nineveh. And he explains the right attitude to have toward your enemies. God was wanting his enemy, Nineveh, uh, the enemy of his people, to be saved, to be changed, not to continue down the path of sin and not to be destroyed. His desire was for them to be saved from destruction. And through the preaching of Jonah, that took place, even though Jonah didn't want that to happen. And then last week we looked at Nahum, which is another prophecy against Nineveh and Assyria about a hundred years later, where God makes the statement that he's just going to wipe them out because their evil has gotten so bad. uh, God is now going to destroy them. And this is the most powerful city and the most powerful nation on the earth. During its strongest and most prosperous time, Nahum comes on the scene and tells him, Assyria will fall. And all Israel hears that and understands that God has decided to be against Assyria, to be against Nineveh, and to destroy them. And history tells us that's what happened. God destroyed Nineveh. God destroyed uh, the Assyrian Empire because of their wickedness. Tonight's lesson is from the book of Obadiah. As you look at it, you see it's just 21 verses, uh, extremely short book, so... Uh, Unless I'm long-winded, this should not take very long. Uh, But this is a book written about Edom. Notice verse 1. The vision of Obadiah, thus says the Lord God concerning Edom. We have heard a report from the Lord, and a messenger has been sent among the nations. Rise up, let us rise against her for battle. So just in verse 1, there's a lot of information. First of all, it tells you just... It's a vision of Obadiah. There's not a lot of information given about Obadiah, but it's concerning Edom. And it's it's a description of how God is calling the nations up for battle against Edom. Edom is about to be destroyed. Well, who is Edom? Who are the Edomites? If you've been studying with us in our Old Testament studies, you're, you're pretty well aware probably of the name Edomite, you probably heard that. Maybe you know where they came from. Uh, but if you were to look at a map, you would see Edom is in the southeast region, south of Jerusalem. Okay, And you've got Ammon, you've got Moab. These are two other nations that, that are similar to Edom because of their relationship to Israel. But Edom is the one that's under consideration throughout this book. Now, why Edom, and what, what is the significance of Edom? Well, Edom is a, a city, or a, a, a nation, that was established going all the way back to Esau. You remember, Abraham was given great promises in the Old Testament. He's this major figure, and the promises come down through his son, Isaac. And then from Isaac, you have two sons. You have 
Jacob and Esau. Esau being the oldest and Jacob being the youngest. And these two brothers are fighting against each other. And so what ends up happening, as you probably remember, is Esau sells his birthright to Jacob for a bowl of soup. And Jacob ends up deceiving, uh, Jacob ends up deceiving his father uh, and ends up getting the blessing from Isaac that comes down through Abraham. So the people of Jacob, the people of Israel, receive the blessing promised to Abraham instead of the Edomites. As you can imagine, uh, that doesn't go well. Uh, but Jacob and Esau seem to work things out later on in life, and eventually they become these two great nations who don't really like each other uh, throughout their existence. If you go to the region of Edom, you'll find some really neat uh, archaeological uh, you know, finds that have been there. They, they found some really neat archaeological uh, significant places. Notice the, the stone, that, uh, the sandstone that they've cut out, the, the buildings and stuff. This is, uh, this is the region where the Edomites would have been living. And the Nabataeans were responsible maybe for some of this, but the Edomites were, were in that land. And as we study through this book, we're going to see references to the hill country of Edom. This was a, a region that had a lot of hills, and, and they took some pride in that, and they thought they were okay because of that. You go through the book, the books of the Old Testament, and you just start noticing the Edomites popping up again and again and again. And it's never really a good thing. Uh, in Numbers chapter 20, after the people of Israel escaped Egyptian captivity, they're going to the promised land and they try to go through the land of Edom and the Edomites say, you will not set foot on our land. And so they have to travel around Edom. Uh, there's some strife, some enmity between Israelites and Edomites. And God actually pronounces judgment against the Edomites uh, in Joel chapter 3. And for, uh, Psalm 137 tells us that those who had escaped or those who had uh, become exiles after the destruction of Jerusalem were calling for Edom to be destroyed. Uh, and so as you go through and you look, even in Lamentations, there's this promise that God is going to now destroy the Edomites. Well, what did they do that was so bad? Why is it that they were destroyed? Well, in Lamentations chapter 4, let me read this real quick. Lamentations chapter 4, verse 21, he says, Rejoice and be glad, O daughter of Edom, you who dwell in the land of Uz. But to you also the cup shall pass. You shall become drunk and strip yourself bare. The punishment of your iniquity, O daughter of Zion, is accomplished. He will keep you in exile no longer. But your iniquity, O daughter of Edom, he will punish. He will uncover your sins. You see, in Lamentations, you remember that book is uh, a book written by probably Jeremiah, lamenting the fall of Jerusalem. And what it says is that these Israelites are going to be encouraged because even though Edom is rejoicing at, at their fall and their destruction, they're encouraged because Edom is going to receive what they deserve. They're going to be punished for their iniquity and for their sins. Uh, Psalm 137 talks about their sins a little bit more directly, and it actually is imprecatory, asking God to smash their children's heads against the wall and, and things like that. It's very graphic. But it's, it's essentially trying to encourage God to, to repay the punishment on the Edomites that they dealt the Israelites. And as we study this, one thing that's important to, to understand is that the Israelites, after the destruction from the Babylonians, were being robbed and, and pillaged and destroyed by surrounding nations. And it seems as though the Edomites were one of those surrounding nations as a, that were a part of the destruction. Well, let's look at this book. And it's only 21 verses, so we're going to read through uh, and see what it says. And we'll see all of this being brought out about the Edomites. Verse 2, it says, Behold, I will make you small among the nations. Remember, this is concerning Edom. 
you shall be utterly despised. The pride of your heart has deceived you. You who live in the clefts of the rock, in your lofty dwelling, who say in your heart, who will bring me down to the ground? Though you soar aloft like an eagle, though your nest is set among the stars, from there I will bring you down, declares the Lord. Notice how he describes Edom as having all this pride and thinking that no one can destroy them and they're completely secure in the clefts of the rock, away from all danger. They think they're just out of, out of uh, any kind of danger zone and everything's going to be okay with them and, and they're secure. And, and they say, who's going to go up against us? Who can possibly defeat us with the way that we're structured? We have the best defenses. And God says, I will. Uh, and that, that is not a good sign uh, if God is against them. Verse 5, if thieves came to you, if plunderers came by night, how you would have been, how you have been destroyed. Would they not steal only enough for themselves? If grape gatherers came to you, would they not leave gleanings? These are rhetorical statements saying uh, if, if this were thieves or if this were grape gatherers, they would leave something behind. And the picture is they haven't left you anything behind. What is this about? Well, verse 6, how Esau has been pillaged, his treasures sought out. All your allies have driven you to, the, to your border. Those at peace with you have deceived you. They have prevailed against you. Those who eat your bread have set a trap beneath you. You have no understanding. Will I not on that day, declares the Lord, destroy the wise men of Edom and understanding out of the mouth of Esau? And your mighty men shall be destroyed, O Taman, so that every man from Mount Esau will be cut off by slaughter. So here in this section, there's kind of three parts to it. First of all, he points out that they are being completely sacked, everything removed, and they're being completely plundered by those that, that come out against them. And then he, he tells us that the allies are going to be the ones who do it. The allies are going to come in, and those who they trust are, are going to take over and destroy and take everything away. They're setting a trap for them. But then God says, I'm going to be the one doing this. Will I not on that day? You're going to know that this is all from me because of the, the, the completeness of the destruction. And he says, I'm going to destroy the wise men. And I'm going to destroy the mighty men. All those who are strong and mighty and wise and they think they, think they know everything, God's going to take them out too. There's no men who are stronger than God. No men who are wiser than God. That they can escape the judgment of God. He's going to destroy them. Well, then the next section begins with this word, because. So all this destruction is coming upon Edom because, verse 10, of the violence done to your brother Jacob. Shame shall cover you, and you shall be cut off forever. On the day that you stood aloof, on the day that strangers carried off his wealth, and foreigners entered his gates and cast lots for Jerusalem. You were like one of them. But do not gloat over the day of your brother on the day of his misfortune. Do not rejoice over the people of Judah in the day of their ruin. Do not boast in the day of distress. Do not enter the gate of my people in the day of their calamity. Do not gloat over his disaster in the day of his calamity. Do not loot his wealth in the day of his calamity. Do not stand at the crossroads to cut off his fugitives. Do not hand over his survivors in the day of distress. Notice the, the description of what they've done wrong is that they are the brother of Jacob. In other words, Edomites are the brothers, the relatives of Israel and the relatives of Judah. And he says, how could you do this violence against your relatives? In fact... When you go back to Deuteronomy 2, you find out Israel was commanded not to, to go up against the Edomites because they were relatives. He, they were commanded not to go up against the Ammonites or the Moabites because they were relatives. But those nations constantly went up against Israel and they were eventually subjugated to Israel. 
And now there's a lot of strife, a lot of contention. And, and as a result, here we see the Edomites are getting their payback. They're, they're coming in and they're, they're kicking Judah and Jerusalem while they're down. And they're taking what they can. And they're doing violence to their own relatives in the day of their calamity. Now, if you're reading through that section and you're just kind of curious because it's worded a little differently in your translation, I, I think the ESV is more in line with what it originally says in the transcripts, but, but as you look at the different translations, they help you understand what's being said a little bit better. Uh, do not gloat over the, the day of your brother, right? That verse 12, do not, do not, do not. You see these commands throughout this section. And you're just like, why, are you, why is God telling the Edomites not to do something? Is this going to happen in the future? Well, he actually has already said that this has happened in the past. So it, it becomes kind of complicated. So a lot of translators have just uh, decided to, to make this very clear, uh, to, to say that they have done this. And that's why they're being judged and, and try to make that point. But the author is giving this as kind of a rhetorical device, so a way of talking to the Edomites, saying, you can't be doing this. Like, why are you doing this? As, uh, it seems as though they're in the process of doing this. And saying, don't do this anymore. Stop it. Uh, you can't do this. And overall, you just get the feeling that this people have become completely cold-hearted and callous. Uh, because they're just focused on what they can get out of the, the Israelites. Oh, this, this great nation, this, this wonderful nation is now open for business. And we can go in and we can get everything we want for free. Well, all we got to do is be stronger than them. And they've been besieged, so they have no way of defending themselves. They've also been destroyed, uh, so they have no way of defending themselves. And so they're going to go in like the rest of the nations and get the leftovers. And you notice in this that God was expecting the Edomites to not stand aloof as everybody goes in and takes advantage of the weakling that has been destroyed. He didn't want them to be like everybody else who just looked at this person being destroyed and, and just waited for their turn to go in and get what they wanted. He didn't want them to be the people who stood at the crossroads and waited for the fugitives to come to put them to death or to hand them over to the Babylonians for a reward. He didn't want them to be that way. He wanted them to be kind and to have pity and mercy on those who are being destroyed. And so because they've rebelled and they've been evil and they've not loved their neighbor as themselves, God is bringing this judgment against them. Verse 15 and 16, uh, Obadiah and God uh, expand this judgment to other nations. Look at verse 15. It says, For the day of the Lord is near upon all the nations. As you have done, it shall be done to you. Your deeds shall return on your own head. For as you have drunk on my holy mountain, so all the nations shall drink continually. They shall drink and swallow and shall be as though they had never been. You notice how God is taking note of all the evil that, this, that these nations are doing against his people as they're coming in and they're, they're enjoying stealing away the things that God had blessed Israel with. And they're having a good time and they think that everything's going great for them because they get all this free stuff. They're like looters going in and just taking what is, is exposed and... and, and uh, seizing the opportunity. But God says uh, they'll, they'll be like they've never been. God's going to just destroy these nations utterly to where there will be no, uh, there will seem like they never even existed. And this is the way God will judge them. Well, verse 17 shifts from focusing in on Esau to focusing in on Zion. And he gives us words of hope, which all the prophets tend to do. Uh, they, they tend to tell us some kind of hope for God's people. Let's read through this. Verse 17, it says, But in Mount Zion there shall be those who escape, and it shall be holy. And the house of Jacob shall possess their own possessions. The house of Jacob shall be a fire, and the house of Joseph a flame. And the house of Esau stubble. They shall burn them and consume them, and there shall be no survivor 
for the house of Esau, for the Lord has spoken. Those of the Negev shall possess Mount Esau, and those of the Shephelah shall possess the land of the Philistines. They shall possess the land of Ephraim and the land of Samaria, and Benjamin shall possess Gilead. The exiles of the host of the people of Israel shall possess the land of the Canaanites as far as Zarephath, and the exiles of Jerusalem who are in Shepharad shall possess the cities of the Negev. Saviors shall go up to Mount Zion to rule Mount Esau, and the kingdom shall be the Lord's. Notice as, as you read through this, the encouragement that God's people would feel as they have been removed from their promised land, and, and, or, and those who have been left, who have, who have survived, have been constantly destroyed and, and taken advantage of by all the surrounding nations. God's giving them encouragement, saying He will restore them, and that they will then become a flame and a fire, and that they will conquer their enemies. And He pictures uh, Esau as being stubble. Those who are most afflicted in the land will end up uh, with the land of their enemies instead of losing all the land, which is what it seems like right now. God's going to bring about a restoration. God's going to bring about a reversal. And then I love the last verse. He says, Saviors shall go up to Mount Zion to rule Mount Esau. And you get the picture of, of those who are a part of God's city are going to dominate the evil, wicked brothers around them and rule over them. And it says, The kingdom shall be the Lord's. The kingdom shall be Yahweh's. This is the last words of this book. And you get the picture that God is going to destroy all these nations and he's going to conquer them and subjugate them to his people and to himself. And, and that the kingdom is going to be even greater than it was before, right? I mean, really, that's, that's what he's getting at as he says all of this in this book. So uh, just to kind of restate that, the message of this book is that the destroyers will be destroyed. The Edomites and all those surrounding nations who have been proud, maybe they've forgotten their sins and they've trusted in themselves and they've taken advantage of other people, they are going to receive the punishment that they deserve for what they have done. Because God is not like them. God does not take pleasure in the death of the wicked. He doesn't want to take advantage of that and abuse that. He wants to bring the wicked to righteousness, to, to help the wicked to see the truth and to be saved. We looked at Ezekiel chapter 18 as we were doing that overview and we saw very clearly God does not take pleasure in the death of the wicked. As God is about to destroy his own people, he makes it very clear, I'm not doing this because I like it. I'm doing this because my justice demands it. I can't clear the guilty and be righteous. In Matthew 5, we read about God, uh, Jesus telling in the Sermon on the Mount to love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And then it says, because God brings the rain on the just and the unjust. And he says he wants us to be perfect like God himself is perfect. And Romans 5 is such an easy passage to remember and to think about uh, as he tells us, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still his enemies, God gave his son that we might be forgiven. So God does not have this mentality toward his enemies that he wants to destroy them uh, and that he, he wants to dominate them and to see them fail. He wants them to succeed. And those who rejoice in the failure of others, he will judge. If you skip over to the book of Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament, uh, and look at beginning at verse 3, this is a prophet who is writing after the captivity has happened and after the people have returned. This is the last prophet of the Old Testament. And he's writing probably hundreds of years after Obadiah. And this is what he has to say. The people are again being rebellious. And they're saying that God doesn't love them. And this is what, this is what God says. Let's start in verse 2. Listen to what God says to his people. I have loved you, says the Lord, but you say, how have you loved us? Is not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord? Yet I have loved Jacob, but Esau I've hated. 
I've laid waste his hill country and left his heritage to jackals in the desert. If Edom says, we are shattered, but we will rebuild the ruins, the Lord of hosts says, they may build, but I will tear down. And they will be called the wicked country and the people with whom the Lord is angry forever. Your eyes shall see this and you shall say, great is the Lord beyond the border of Israel. What we find in history is that the Edomites are removed from the land and a new nation comes in called the Nabataeans and they take over the land uh, in the 300s B.C. So, so God is going to judge those who rejoice in the fall of others and he does it. He does exactly what he says he will do because this statement from God that we find in James 2 is true. Judgment is without mercy for those who show no mercy. That's the message of this book. You're not going to show any pity or mercy to someone else. You're going to be harsh and judgmental toward those who have fallen and who are beaten up and who need help. You're not going to receive mercy if you treat them this way. And then there's a message here to God's people. The message uh, from Edom is the destroyers will be destroyed and God's going to be just and he's going to judge those who have no mercy. But then there's a message here of hope to his people. As God makes it very clear, he's going to fulfill the promises that he made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. As you see Esau and Jacob in, in conflict with one another, and it appears as though Esau is going to win, God makes it very clear here. He remembers his promise to Jacob that, that all the nations of the earth will be blessed through his seed and that he will become a great nation and he will possess the land he, re he remembers those promises and he will give those promises to the descendants of Jacob and they will not go to the descendants of Esau. And also we see hope as God makes it very clear that his descendants will obtain a possession that's much greater than their fathers. And, and he also tells them the kingdom will again return to Yahweh. In the past, there's been earthly kings and there's been men who've been set up over the kingdoms of God. But now God is going to take control back for himself. And he makes that very clear. So there's a message of hope in this little book uh, that God is going to restore and rebuild and renew and that he's going to give all the promised blessings to his people and he will again rule in justice and righteousness over them. So how do we apply this? Well... Think for a minute about how we feel when our enemies fall. Think for a minute about uh, those who have done a great wrong against you. What kind of attitude do we have when we see this person who's been so mean to me, who maybe has taken advantage of my failure and used it to promote themselves and, and kicked me while I, when I'm down, how do we feel when they fall? Ah, well, they got what they deserved. And maybe we're going to take advantage. It's like running a race. Somebody trips you up on the start, and then, oh, look, they fall. Ha, 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 I'm going to run at them. I'm going to laugh at them as I run by them to the finish line. And that, that kind of mentality is, is maybe what we have. As long as we benefit, we don't really care about them. They're our enemies. And this is the mentality and the idea of the world around us right now. As they, as they consider those who have, who have failed or those who have lost in some way, they think, well, good riddance, and that's what you deserve. And they just let that person uh, suffer and wallow in, in their suffering. It's really easy for us to feel good about ourselves when we see someone who's evil suffering. I like the way John MacArthur put it. He said that whenever we see our enemies fall, it takes away the pain of our inadequacies and it magnifies our successes. Really, that's what it's doing. And, that's, and it kind of makes us feel good about ourselves. It makes us feel good inside when we see those who are our enemies suffering uh, and, and we think they deserve it and I'm so much better than them and that's why I don't have to go through all of that. But really, God wants us to think, what if I help them in their distress? 
I know they've done a lot of wrong against me. Uh, maybe my spouse has been extremely evil and, and mean toward me, and, and they don't deserve my forgiveness. And, and, or maybe my boss has, has abused my trusting nature, my generosity, and he's used me and abused me. Uh, and now they're, they're suffering because they've cheated and they've done something wrong. And maybe now we want to, to take advantage of this opportunity, but what if we help them? What if instead of standing aloof and letting them go through all the suffering that they deserve, we actually gave them a helping hand? If we're running a race and we see them fall, what if we help them up and we carry them to the finish line? Think about the difference that that would make. Think about the different kind of statement that you would be sending and that how that relationship would be mended that has been torn apart for so long because of the constant biting and, and revenge that we've been seeking against one another. This is what God wants us to see. He wants us to be humble, and He wants us to realize that if we'll just be faithful to Him, that we have a promise of a greater, greater possession, we don't have to seek our own success and our own glory. God wants to give us glory. He wants to give us an inheritance that is greater than anything we might be able to grab for ourselves by dominating those who have fallen by taking advantage of their failures. You remember Matthew 5? In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, Blessed are the meek. And the meek is a picture of those who have all this power at their disposal, but they don't use it. They have control of it. Uh, they don't seek their own. They don't push to get their own way. And Jesus says, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Interesting statement there. As you think about the promises that are being made in the book of Obadiah, that they'll have these great possessions, and they'll possess the lands of all their enemies, that Jesus then comes in and says, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. In Romans 4 and Galatians 3, we have a depiction of Christians being the descendants of Abraham who received the inheritance that was promised to Abraham. And the, the inheritance is the whole world. And so there is some future hope for all who are in Christ to have land for themselves where they rule and they are in control. This is getting into the promises of God, which we're going to be studying in great detail next year in, in our theme. But, but I wanted to see this as we look at this book, the significance of this idea and so I think the most powerful text is Hebrews chapter 11. So I want to read a little bit from Hebrews chapter 11 before we close. In Hebrews 11, he talks about Abraham's faith, how Abraham was willing to leave his homeland and, and travel to a land that he didn't know. And, and by faith, he went and lived as a foreigner in that land, believing that God would one day give that land to him and to his descendants. And he died, having not been given that land in his life. In verse 13, it says of Hebrews 11, These all died, Sarah, Abraham, uh, they all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For people who speak thus, make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they'd been thinking of the land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. You see the picture of a promised home, a heavenly land that is offered to those who live with faith and trust in God and who are not seeking the land that is here. What, what did we see before this sermon? This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. This is what God's people have to learn, that we're not striving and seeking after a possession that is here on earth. 
We're not looking for those around us to fall so that we can take advantage and get what we want on this earth. We're seeking a heavenly home. And what God reveals to us about that, that gift is that it's not given to us because we beat somebody else and we're more righteous or we're better than them in some way. But it's given to us because He loves us. And because even though we're enemies and we don't deserve it, He wanted to shower His love on us and He wanted to transform our hearts to become like Him. He wanted us to be like His Son, the perfect image of God who loved His neighbor more than He loved Himself and gave himself to die for his enemy. And that's what God calls for us to do as well. If you're here this evening and you've not accepted the call of God and not accepted the, the freedom and the gift of forgiveness that he offers to you, uh, we want to help you in any way that we can. We want to encourage you. We want to study with you. Uh, we want to, to, to walk with you through the journey of understanding more about God and and we want to assist you in your struggles with sin and, and temptation and in your struggles uh, with, with dealing with this world and the trials that go on with it. Will you be a part of us and will you be a part of God's kingdom? Will you put on Christ and receive all the blessings that are promised to those who live by faith? If you will, and if you have need, please come as we stand and as we sing.